right. Well, <coughs> it is time to sit down and talk about global poverty. I've got my giant Starbucks no foam half skim half decaf latte in front of me, but I figure it's cool because it's fair trade. Anyway, global poverty, this is the first of the sort of applied sections of the class. For the past few weeks, we've been talking mostly about general theories of equality, <clears throat> general theories of political morality, and especially general theories about distributive justice. That is specifically the morality of how all of the valuable things in society ought to be distributed among people. So today we're going to look at a specific application of those things. Um, hopefully this will both be interesting for its own sake. It raises some questions that are interesting and specific to the issue of global poverty. Um, and hopefully we'll also give a little bit of a model of <clears throat> pardon me, a little bit of a model of how you can apply some of these broader theoretical things to actual issues that people have. I apologize if I cough or snuffle a little bit uh, during this. I'm a little bit under the weather, but I figured that you all would not want to wait a minute longer than you have to to hear all about global poverty. Uh, the last thing to say by way of introduction is that while the readings and this discussion um, We'll focus largely on poverty and wealth inequality on the international scale. Of course, a lot of the issues that we're going to talk about, um, a lot of the considerations, theoretical and practical, also apply to domestic poverty. Um, hopefully that will be obvious. If it's not, of course, it's something we can talk about uh, in class. But global poverty also brings up some special issues. So. Here are the basic ideas that make this into a problem, right? You might know that people are poor on the world, but not, uh, not frame that as something that is a particular problem for you. So here's the problem. Uh, the prima facie problem is, is really kind of stupidly obvious. The prima facie issue, prima facie just means on the face of it, lots of people in the world have very little money, radically small amounts of money and wealth and access to the kinds of resources that money and wealth can buy. Uh, most, well, the PowerPoint says most of the people in this room, uh, probably there's only one of you in the room uh, where you are right now, most of the people who are taking this class have quite a lot of money and wealth. Uh, now that these things are going out on YouTube, perhaps there are people who do not have quite a lot of money or wealth who will be watching this. Um, but the original context, the folks who are going to be at the Maryland School of Public Policy, uh, taking a course on this, globally speaking, you're really well off. If you are even at the middle of the American wealth distribution or the European wealth distribution, you're doing pretty well in global context. Um, if you're someone like me, uh, according to the latest U.S. Census data that I was able to find, I am the 17% uh, in the U.S. So, you know, by U.S. standards, something like your humble assistant professor, far from fabulously wealthy, uh, but by global standards, just unbelievably wealthier than a lot of people on the planet. And this isn't just a matter of money. You know, even if we control for things like purchasing power parity, and even if we ignore luxuries, I mean, forget luxuries. In the kind of life that I lead, I don't on a day-to-day -day basis have to wonder, will I have enough food to eat? Will I have uh, you know, heat and electricity and those sorts of things in my house? Will I have a roof over my head? Um, you know, even leaving aside the, the kinds of luxuries that most Americans uh, like me have in their lives, there are parts of our lives that are just stable and secure and comfortable in a way that lives of the globally very poor, or even of the American poor, are not. Um, it extends even to things that you may not initially think of. Uh, one of the debates that has gone on in development economics <clears throat> has been over the thesis that, that um, 
overall wealth does not make people happier. There's been some data back and forth about uh, whether it's overall wealth or comparative wealth or, or you know, whether people in poor countries are just as happy as people in wealthy countries, that sort of thing. But one of the things that, that uh, was mentioned in part of this debate by uh, Bill Easterly, actually, who you read one of his blog posts for this for this class. Um, one of the thing he pointed out is, on the side of the folks who want to say um, life is happier, not just wealthier, but that people in developed countries tend to be happier, uh, on the on the side of that kind of interpretation of the data, there are things that we just don't think about uh, in the affluent parts of the affluent world on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for, well, for more Americans than it should be, especially compared to Europe, but for fairly affluent, you know, middle class and up Americans, middle class and up Europeans, um, infant mortality is just not a day-to-day -day concern. People have miscarriages, this sort of thing, but it's not something that when I had my daughter, I figured, well, it was kind of a crapshoot whether or not she was going to live. Uh, that sort of thing can be the case in a lot of places in the world, and that's a profound impact on... That sort of thing is the profound impact on the kind of quality of life people have, right? So, when we look at the world, what generates people's feeling that this is a problem is we're not just talking about, well, people can't buy the latest Depeche Mode CD. We're talking about people having levels of income and wealth that do not give them access to what a lot of those of us in the wealthier part of the world take to be the basic minimums of comfort and safety and stability in our lives. Okay, so that's just a fact about the world. That's not yet moral. So there are two moral perspectives on poverty that need to be considered. And um, they sometimes go together, they can come apart and they have different implications. <clears throat> the first is, well, poverty is bad. Uh, again, this may seem stupidly obvious, but there's a reason for at least distinguishing them. If you have low income wealth levels, um, your life is not going to go as well. Uh, you will not be able to get things that make you happy, that sort of thing. Uh, you also will, will in some way be, some ways be less free. This goes back to, like I said, the the insight that the libertarians and the liberal egalitarians share is that some degree of material resources are necessary to meaningfully exercise freedom. The other potential issue that people worry about is that poverty might be unfair. Now, remember, right? it can be bad but not unfair. Um, but it might be unfair. And to answer the question of whether whether it's unfair, we need to ask the question of why. Why is it that uh, that I am so wealthy and other people are so poor? Uh, is it because of me, or is it because of the system, or is it because of the poor people doing something wrong, or what? Or is it just chance or luck? Uh, and the answers to those sorts of questions are important to answering the question of whether or not global wealth inequalities, global poverty, are unfair in addition to being bad. The difference between something being bad and something being unfair, uh, at least in this sense, uh, this is the point behind Pogge's example of the Venusians. If you remember from his, from his article, uh, he talks about, well look, we imagine we found life on Venus, right? Uh, and it was very people on Venus were very poor, and it was very bad there. Uh, probably we would say this is bad, this is unfortunate, maybe it would be nice of us uh, to do something about it. But it wouldn't be unfair. We could, we could very plausibly say, whatever else, whatever other obligations we have to these, to these poor, impoverished Venusians, we literally have nothing to do with their, with their poverty. Um, and so, at least at the initial moment of contact, uh, their situation is bad, but not in any clear way unfair. And the distinction between the badness and the unfairness is going to is actually going to go very deeply to the distinction between the way that liberals and utilitarians uh, will approach the issue of global poverty and what kinds of policies 
and moral obligations they think uh, should flow from a recognition of it. So in order to answer these questions, uh, well, in order to, to address these issues, we need to answer a number of significant questions about global poverty. First is, what exactly do we mean by poverty? Both of the larger readings assume that by poverty we mean something like wealth inequality. Uh, and, you know, let's, let's not be facetious here. That's a, that's a big part of it. Um, if I am in the upper 17% of American income, household income, uh, and you are in Jeffrey Sachs' uh, bottom billion. You're one of the people who's who's making uh, a purchase uh, purchasing power parity adjusted income of a dollar a day or less. Um, there's a clear way in which I am better off than you are. Um, there's all sorts of other factors that might go in, but let's not be facetious and ignore that income means something in in our world. But there might be other aspects of it, uh, and this is uh, actually part of the point of giving you the shorter pieces, how to write about Africa and uh, how to write about the poor, is that uh, we should be a little bit hesitant to identify poverty alleviation directly and precisely with uh, increasing GDP. And this opens a whole can of worms, but it's worth, I put it first because it's worth keeping in the back of your head, about things like do we want to increase people, increase the GDP of a particular area if it means that they will uh, consume vastly more resources? Um, do we want to increase the GDP of the area if it means changing their economy to a system that will disrupt communal relations or traditional cultures? You know, do we want to, you know, does development need to look like the kind of manufacturing and consumer driven sort of economy that we that we have here uh, in a place like the US or are there alternative models that might actually be that might actually be better um, so at the same time that I want to say let's not be disingenuous let's not be facetious and pretend like oh, you know, people living on a dollar a day, uh, their lives are so much better. They live in a kind of romantic poverty, and I'm going to pretend that I wish I lived like them. Let's be serious. There are actual serious policy implications for wanting to get beyond uh, just an issue of money. <clears throat> so, for instance, uh, Europeans, on average, tend to have less money than Americans. But often standard of living is considered higher because certain things are cheaper there's some you know they've more things are available for free there are other kinds of environmental factors that go into this that sort of thing um, one of the very influential changes in the way the UN has measured poverty I think this is the last 15 15 ish years or so has been a shift from looking merely at GDP to looking at um, uh, other indicators of human development. Uh, so, if you're familiar with, if you're looking at the development literature, you probably are familiar with the Human Development in, Human Development Index. <clears throat> and this is actually this is the one point of pride I get to have as a philosopher. This is actually something that was driven in significant part by the pioneering work of uh, Amartya Sen who is actually an economist by training, but philosophers, we like to claim him as, as uh, at least a fellow traveler, and Martha Nussbaum, who is actually a philosopher. And their approach was based on the idea that what is important to human life is not having a lot of stuff that you can measure directly by GDP, but more about having certain powers to act in the world. So, um, being able to have families, being able to enjoy nature, being able to enjoy political freedoms, being able to have fulfilling work, that sort of thing. Um, Sen has uh, has notoriously resisted giving a list of capabilities. Um, Nussbaum has presented various versions of a list of human capabilities, but 
this idea is what goes behind HDI, measuring things by, uh, by way of the HDI. And so the HDI will measure, there's some interesting philosophical issues with the measurement here, but they will measure things like literacy rates as part of the index that tells you how developed a country is. Um, and, in, and more recently, they've started compiling, the UN has started compiling a data set of inequality adjusted human development index, uh, which is there to capture the idea that it doesn't, if your infant mortality rate on average is, you know, whatever, 1%, but it's 10 times as high among certain groups in the population, among the poor, uh, as it is among the wealthy, that should affect our, our sense of how well the country is doing as a whole. But, so all of this just goes into this issue of when we think about helping people out from a moral standpoint, we might actually want to consider what exactly it is we mean by poverty and what exactly it is that we're trying to alleviate. Um, and this might affect the kinds of policies that we think about, uh, think about promoting. Uh, if all we care about is GDP, we may not spend as much money on things like lowering infant mortality rates. Okay, the second question, this is the, really the big one that goes to unfairness, is <clears throat> who is responsible for global poverty? Is global poverty something that just happened? Uh, is it the fault of corrupt regimes in the, in the poorer parts of the world? Is it the fault of bad culture in the poorer parts of the world? Is it the fault of capitalism? Is it the fault of free trade? Is it the fault of colonialism? Um, is it the fault of mere random variation? The answer we give to who is responsible for all of this, whether it's me or you or somebody else or nobody, uh, is very relevant to the question of whether or not there's any unfairness involved. And connected to the next question, which is who has obligations um, from the existence of global poverty? What kinds of obligations does it does it lay on us? Um, do we have to give up our money? Would it be nice for us to give up our money? Do we have to do something more radical? Do we have to dismantle the capitalist machine? Do we have to, you know, whatever? Um, and then there are a there's a specific issue that relates to global poverty as opposed to domestic po poverty, which is the question of whether or not there are obligations of justice across national borders. We're actually going to talk about this question much more later on in the semester, so I'm going to largely leave it aside, but just keep it in mind. There are some theorists who essentially say, <clears throat> within nations, we have obligations to help those who are, who are less well off. I have obligations to help people who live in inner city Baltimore, but that there are no such obligations across national borders. Either there's not enough interaction or a very popular argument that we'll talk about in some more detail is that in the absence of a political unity, a political community, um, there are no obligations of justice. We have those domestically, we don't have them internationally. This is kind of a Hobbes-ish argument. We will come back to it. And the last question is, and again, this is tied to the who's responsible and what obligations questions there are, is that even if we have some moral obligations arising from poverty and wealth inequality, are these obligations of justice or are they obligations of charity? Uh, Pogi talks about this in terms of negative and positive duties. Uh, and a big reason why we might worry about these is has to do with the, the relative strictness that many people place on one or the other. A moral obligation of charity, or uh, what's sometimes called a, in, what, what Poggi is calling in this context, a positive duty, is one that um, is typically considered less stringent. It's about what I ought to do if I want to be a good person, if I want to improve my moral, my moral standard. Kant called these imperfect duties. And the reason he called them that captures what is part of a lot of people's intuitions about these, which is that they are not quite 
strict. So for Kant, for instance, the duty of beneficence, the duty to give to those who are less well off than you, was imperfect in the sense that Kant was saying, I, I don't have to give money to every beggar that I see. But if I never give money to beggars, I'm a bad person. So the idea is you should do some, but, you know, you don't have to give away all your money. You should give away a reasonable amount. And as Pogge points out in the issue of global poverty, this might also run up against other kinds of charitable things that we might do. There's all sorts of good things that we might we might do to, to help other people out, and they're all they're all morally laudable, or at least arguably morally laudable. <clears throat> so part of the question is, when I think about the global poor, are they yet another charitable cause that goes in against um, you know giving money to cancer research, giving money to the university I graduated from, giving money to my congregation, uh, you know giving money to uh, the local, you know, the, the local community library. Are these all roughly similar? You're a good person if you give to something like that. You're probably, you know, you're maybe morally questionable if you never give any of your money to good causes or any of your time to good causes. But, you know, if, if I choose to donate money to the village learning place here in Baltimore, and you choose to donate money to cancer, breast cancer research, and uh, someone else chooses to donate money to Oxfam or with Doctors Without Borders, you know, is it just one of these things where we say, oh, well, you know, different people are specifically focused on different causes, or is there something inherently more important about uh, giving to the global poor? So the other perspective is that our obligations to the poor are not obligations of charity. They're not positive obligations in, in the way Pogge talks about it. They're not imperfect duties the way Kant talks about it. But perhaps they are, um, they arise from negative duties. Uh, they arise from, and this is similar, it's a correlative negative rights. Um, and it's what I'm calling here duties of justice, what Pogge calls negative duties, what Kant calls perfect duties. The idea that there are some things that we must not do. All right, and you might think, how is wait? How is um, helping the poor a way of not doing something? We'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. But the basic idea would be that if we, you, I, other wealthy people, if we are responsible for the poor being poor we might have a strict negative duty either to stop doing whatever it is that is making them poor or at the very least compensate them for the harm that we are doing them. So on this picture, if I give money to the poor, um, I am not just doing something that makes me a nice guy. I am compensating them for a harm that I'm doing to them. And uh, similarly, if I choose to give money to the village learning place here in Charles Village, uh, instead of giving money to Oxfam, you might criticize me for that. You might legitimately criticize me for that because you would, you, you would be able to say, giving money to Oxfam is like paying your debts. Giving money to charity is, um, you know, is just a nice thing. I shouldn't give money to charity until I have already paid all of the debts that I actually Oh, um, which perspective you take on this is actually quite important from a policy level. Most of the time, we we again we here in the wealthy countries seem to treat global assistance to the poor as a kind of charity. It's kind of thing that makes us nice. Um, you know, most people are in favor of some degree of foreign aid. Some interesting data in the U.S. that people think we give too much, but we actually give much less than, than they think we give. Um, but that aside, most people favor some level of it, but they think it's because it makes us nice. And we treat it different, f differently from other kinds of things. So um, foreign aid is a very popular sort of thing to suggest cutting. 
And we treat it differently, for instance, from things like the debt, right? So if you remember uh, here in the US, a little while ago, we had the fight about the debt ceiling. And more or less nobody in this conversation, you know, there's all sorts of talk about, well, you know, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, um, we're going to have to drastically cut social programs. And they didn't talk too much about foreign aid, but foreign aid probably would have been on the chopping block because, you know, we can't default on our debt. Horrors. We cannot default on the debt, right? You didn't hear pretty much anyone in the mainstream saying anything like, well, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we can only spend so much by law. So I guess we're just going to have to thumb our nose at our, at our creditors so we can keep paying for social programs. You certainly, it would have been even more radical to hear someone say, well, you know, we, we can't cut our foreign aid. I mean, certainly. So um, if the debt ceiling doesn't get raised, I guess we'll just have to, 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 to say goodbye to all the people we owe money to because it's more important that we, that we pay our foreign aid. Right, and the difference in the in this perspective is that it was a basic sort of implicit premise of the whole argument that you have to pay your debts. You have an absolute perfect obligation to pay your debts. It would be unjust to not pay your debts. It's the rule. But social programs, foreign aid—that's what you do to be a, to be good, to be a nice country. Um, after you're done paying your debts, paying your debts is the absolute. So if we really saw the money that we give to the poor as a kind of debt, as an obligation of justice, rather than as a kind of charity, that would significantly shift the kind of policy debates that we have over the issue. Okay. Pardon me. So for the next part, what I'm going to do is exactly what I tell you not to do in your memos. So I apologize. But what we're going to do is look at the issue of poverty and the issue of obligations to the global poor from the two different major theoretical perspectives that we have talked about so far in class. And this is one of these things on which uh, actually to some extent the liberal and the libertarian perspective, um, they share more than, the, than they diverge. I think liberals and libertarians would come up with different policies, but in terms of the deep structure of what is it that we owe to the poor and why, um, there's a lot of convergence. So we're going to talk about utilitarians and then liberals. And in the readings, uh, Singer's piece is uh, one of the classics of utilitarian writing on this. And Pogge is sort of standing in for the liberals. Pogge is clearly a liberal egalitarian, not a libertarian. But uh, his mode of argument um, Hopefully you will at least see why his motive argument is designed to try to appeal even to those who might have libertarian sympathies. Um, okay, let's start with the utilitarians though, because the utilitarians are much, 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 much more straightforward. For the utilitarian, all that matters is that being poor is bad for the poor. Uh, it doesn't really matter why poor people are poor. Put, a, put an asterisk next to that. There's one caveat on that. But the basic thing is for the utilitarian, it does. It simply does not matter why, why poor people are poor, for the most part. All that matters is that um, poor people are badly off, rich people are well off, and thanks to the magic of distributing, uh, pardon me, of diminishing marginal utility, if the wealthy people gave some of their wealth to the poor people, the aggregate total, the, the total global utility would be improved. Uh, hopefully this is familiar to you from Econ 101, but if it's not, the basic idea behind this is just that if you give me $1,000, you know, that matters. I would, I would notice uh, if you gave me $1,000. It wouldn't, but it wouldn't change my lifestyle. Um, I might buy something nice that I wouldn't otherwise have bought, but it's not going to overall change my lifestyle. If you give Bill Gates a thousand dollars, he will not. He will not even notice. Bill Gates might make more money in the time that it took you to hand him the thousand uh, dollars than than the thousand dollars you gave him. 
On the other hand, if you give a thousand dollars to a poor person in um, Sierra Leone, that that might change their life. You know, maybe now they can start a business that they never would have been able to do. This might be two, three times what they would what they would make in a year. Um, maybe even more. I mean, if it's if it's someone who's poor by Sierra Leonean standards or poor by Bangladeshi standards, this might be five times what they what they make in a year, or even more. I you know I'm not sure what the the re, the true poorest of the poor. Um, so the idea is just that the same thousand dollars of money is worth more, obviously, to someone who doesn't have as much money. And so if you transfer it from me to them, the overall happiness of the world increases. That's what the utilitarians care about. Now, here's the asterisk. Of course, utilitarians, as we talked about in class, care about these sort of total world histories. So they might care to some extent about things like um, if I give money, will this make people not work as much? Will it create dependence? Uh, they certainly could, should worry about things like, um, if we give aid in a badly planned way, will this destroy local industries and make it harder for them to recover and that sort of thing? But to a first approximation, even, well, okay, to a first approximation, it's just about the marginal utility. And even when we're talking about, well, will my aid destroy local industries, it still doesn't really matter why the people are poor. Forward-looking, it matters whether what I do will end up counterintuitively and perversely making them worse off in the long run. But it only the reason why they're poor only matters to the extent that that tells us something about what would happen in the long run. So even if everyone in Bangladesh who's poor is poor because they're irresponsible wastrels, as long as I think they've mended their ways, I don't I don't care why they're poor, if I'm a utilitarian. So, on this basis, starting from, the, from, what, he, from what he takes to be this, this real uncontroversial idea, uh, Singer proposes that this indicates that we actually, we wealthy-ish people, um, actually ought to be doing a lot more for the poor than we actually do. And again, this is very straightforward utilitarian grounds. Singer proposes uh, two principles. The first one is what he calls his, his moderate principle. Um, and he proposes it actually not because he thinks it is the true moral obligation that wealthy-ish people like most of us stand under. It's that he thinks this principle is so moderate, so milk toast so uncontroversial when you think about it that everybody should accept it. And the strong implication is that the only reason that we don't act in accord with the moderate principle is that most of us, well, we don't want to, and we have become very good at psychologically insulating ourselves from the results of our decisions. The reason why we don't act in accord with the moderate principle is basically because we intentionally and unintentionally blind ourselves to the decisions we're actually making so that we're not faced with it. So the moderate principle is that if someone is uh, in a bad state, if someone is poor, uh, and you could make them better off without sacrificing something of comparable moral significance, then you ought to do it. And the intuitive idea is this. It says, look, imagine that uh, this is not exactly the example he gives, but this basically this kind of example. Um, he's actually this very famous example about a Bugatti, but we'll talk about that later. Um, imagine that I am walking to, to, teach, to teach the class and um, I see, uh, there's actually, there's a, so there's a pool at the bottom of the hill heading up towards the Delphi Road. So I see a child floundering and drowning in the pool. Um, there's no one else around. I don't know how the kid got in. There's no one else around. And I'm a pretty decent swimmer. It's a pretty small kid. I could jump into the pool and save the kid. But, you know, 
I'm going to ruin the wonderful linen pants that I'm wearing by jumping into this chlorine water. And these pants cost me like $30. I'm actually wearing cheap jeans, but for the sake of the, for the, sake of the example, give me nice pants. All right, so I'm going to ruin my nice pants if I jump in and save the kid. Now, if I didn't do it and someone came along and uh, said, oh my God, you know, sir, did you see that child drowning? Why didn't you do anything? I said, well, I could have saved him, but, uh, you know, these pants, they're like $30. Okay, I would be a moral monster, right? I might not be prosecutable for anything. Uh, I might in places that have good Samaritan laws, right? But I would be a, like, no one would accept that explanation, right? If I, if I told you that in the class, you all would rightly be horrified. So Singer's point is that the only difference between that and a lot of poor people in the world is physical distance. And as long as we have the opportunity to help people, physical distance shouldn't matter that much. Right? There's all sorts of diseases, for instance, where $30 can make the difference between life and death for someone. So what Singer is basically saying is, look, if you would be a moral monster for not jumping in saving a drowning kid because you're going to ruin your $30 pants, why aren't you a moral monster for not sending $30 to you know, Oxfam or Doctors Without Borders where they might be able to use that $30 to save someone's life? Um, what's the difference? The only difference is that you don't, you don't, you're not seeing the other person. right? The only difference is that you don't feel as bad about it because you're not seeing that other person and frankly because you have a reinforcing social structure. If we all treated each other as moral monsters for not giving money to Oxfam instead of spending it on new clothes that we don't necessarily, that we don't absolutely need, um, well, probably more of us would give money to charity, right? Um, if we if we all really condemned each other for that. If if when I said, "Hey, I bought myself a new pair of pants." Um, Instead of my wife saying, oh, let me see them, if she, if she said, wait, you didn't absolutely need a new pair of pants and uh, you could have given that money to Oxfam, you know, and looked at me with the same look of abject horror, she would probably look at me if I said, yeah, I didn't save a drowning child that was right next to me because I didn't want to ruin my pants. Probably I would buy less pants and give more money to Oxfam. Um, yeah, so that's the basic idea. The basic idea is that your pants are not impor more important than somebody's life. And so the moderate principle is not saying when, you, when it comes to morally important stuff, Singer on the moderate principle is, is not saying that you have to give it up, right? He's not saying drain your child's college account uh, to give money to Oxfam. He's not saying sell your house and live in a yurt to give money to Oxfam. He's not saying, you know, never, ever, 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 um, have any fun to give money to Oxfam. All he's saying is that we have plenty of things in our lives that are frankly of fairly trivial moral importance. We all, you know, and again, we wealthy-ish people, most of the people probably listening to this, we have clothes we don't absolutely need. We have houses that are bigger than what we need. We have televisions. We have computer games. We have Depeche Mode albums. We have linen pants. We have all sorts of things that our lives would be just as fulfilling without. And that money could be spent on somebody else. Now, what Singer actually thinks is the true moral principle is the more radical one that says uh, you have to um, give until you would be giving up something comparably more morally significant. All right, so the first one is just that you should give unless you would have to sacrifice something significant, period. In the intuitive sense that we know that Depeche Mode albums are not significant and lives are significant. And even things like college education for your child is significant. The radical principle is that you should give until you have to give up something comparably moral, morally significant. So it's not just that if I uh, spend $30 on pants, well, we know that pants are not morally significant. It's that if I'm going to spend $100,000 on my daughter's college education, I should be asking, well, 
With $100,000, I could save probably dozens of lives, conservatively. Um, is my daughter getting a college education really more morally important than saving, some, saving hundreds of lives? Singer thinks that really morality requires the radical principle of us. But he'll be happy with the moderate principle and he's happy to say that if, if we even followed the moderate principle, we would be doing so much more good for the world um, that, that that would be a massive improvement. Okay, so that's basically the utilitarian argument for giving. Utilitarians send a fairly radical um, and fairly demanding pictures of what we owe, uh, especially on an individual level. Um, and they focus exclusively on the badness of poverty, right? Like the child example. Um, if I don't save them, it doesn't matter to most people's assessment whether the kid broke into the pool after hours and fell in, or whether the kid was just minding his own, bin minding his own business, you know, swimming in a time when he normally would have been able to swim, right? Even, I mean, you might think, oh, well, it's because of the kid, right? Even if it's an adult, right? If I just walk on by an adult who is drowning, most people don't care that much whether they were drowning because they were breaking into someone's swimming pool or they're drowning because they're swimming in their own pool and doing something, you know, completely morally fine. It's just the badness of it, right? If I walked by and I said, well, I didn't want to ruin my pants, and also that guy had clearly broken into the swimming pool, so he deserves what he gets, right? You'd probably still look at me with a significant degree of, of, of horror, right? I'd be some sort of weird breaking and entering vigilante. You wouldn't go, oh, okay, well, it's his own damn fault, so it's fine that you let him drown, right? So, utilitarianism taps into our intuitions about badness. So what about unfairness? <clears throat> liberal theorists are not going to be, both liberal egalitarians and libertarians, are not going to be absolutely impressed by the mere badness of poverty. Lots of them care about badness, that's fine. Um, you know, most of them would want to make room for us voluntarily helping people out of badness. But if we have a, if we have an obligation, especially if our, if our, our states, our political communities have an obligation to help the poor, there has to be some sort of unfairness involved. Um, so for the liberal, the first question is going to be, when they look out at all of the stuff in the world, they say, well, all right. Um, lots of people have a lot of stuff. Well, a smallish number of people, relatively speaking, have a lot of stuff. A very large number of people have uh, almost no stuff. Is this the kind of scenario that could plausibly be fair? Is there any sort of contract that people could have agreed to that would end up with this kind of distribution. If there is, if there is a fair contract that's led us here, a fair system of social organization that's led us here, maybe we don't have any obligations, or at least none of these very strict obligations of justice or compensation. Maybe we'd just be nice if we gave money to the poor. But if the system of distribution is not fair, or at least basically fair, then we have serious obligations of justice on a liberal schema. Again, those, those obligations might be to change the system, it might be to pay some kind of compensation, or it might be a combination of both. And the liberal, because they're not just concerned with badness, um, they're going to be looking to balance in some morally plausible way the sacrifice that's required of the haves with the disadvantage of the have-nots. It's not just the, the badness of the have-nots um, that is involved. It's their disadvantage. It's their the unfairness of their position. And what is demanded of the people with money must itself be fair. It, can't, it, it would not be right on a liberal picture to unfairly or unjustly take my things to give to someone who is poor. Uh, to make clear why I mention this, I mean, this is really just to highlight that even un even just a, a blanket recognition of unfairness is not 
going to be enough to give you your policy prescription for a liberal, right? For a utilitarian, it's enough to know that people are badly off. For a liberal, it's not even enough just to know that it's unfair. You have to know who is the source of that unfairness, right? So to take a, a homely example, if I steal something from you, well, that's unfair, but uh, you're not going to go grab some random third person and make them and make them pay you back. You're going to try to find me. So liberals are going to be more interested than utilitarians are with finding the source of the badness, um, in addition to just knowing that it's that it's unfair. Okay. So Pogi proposes three possibilities for why you might think that the current system of distribution, the current way that wealth is distributed in the world is not just bad for a lot of people, but is actually unfair. The first is um, that it might be that the rules of the game are unfair. There's a global system of trade rules, um, debt rules, international laws, laws of sovereignty, yada, 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 um, that we, you and I, wealthy-ish people, especially people in the US and Europe, actively support. Um, someone asked the question in class uh, yesterday as I'm recording this about whether or not libertarians would support using uh, military force abroad to keep trade routes open. Uh, and, you know, whatever libertarians think about it, this is something we actually do, right? So if the system is in some way unfairly disadvantaging people, if the rules of the game are unfair, we are actively involved in maintaining them. We're actively involved in making sure that the rules of the game continue and we, we pay money, we pay blood and treasure to enforce those rules. And there are a number of parts of the rules of the system that are quite plausibly unfair. Uh, one of the big ones that Pogi alludes to is the mere existence of states. For the most part, a system of state sovereignty, uh, we say, however the government wants to run things, that's largely something that other countries don't have, you know, don't have any say in, or actually even worse than don't have any say in. That's something that other countries are obligated to support. So um, if your government is run by a corrupt regime, most of the, that benefits a, a wealthy few at the expense of impoverishing uh, very many, most other governments will say, well, we, it's not our business. We don't, we don't interfere in that. Um, and furthermore, if someone were to try to overthrow the regime, might even step in to stop it, right? Might even step in to say, no, no, you can't, you can't do that. Uh, there are, of course, you know, we're recording this at the tail end of, uh, of the Arab Spring, um, or maybe not the tail end, what seems to maybe be the, the, the tapering off with uh, people talking about trying to overthrow the regime in Syria. But it's going to be pretty egregious before folks talk about, you know, militarily overthrowing unjust regimes, right? Um, even bracketing all sorts of, you know, leftist and rightist kind of conspiracy theories about these things. You know, Karathi starts shelling cities and you get a at least a halfway plausible argument for intervention. But there are plenty of just corrupt governments. There are plenty of just governments that aren't very good for their people, and we don't we don't talk about overthrowing them. Right? There are plenty of governments where there's massive inequality that is suborned by government corruption. And nobody's gonna go overthrow them. Uh, and in fact, we would we would try to stop them from doing it, probably, uh, if, if, if folks did, at least in, at least in a lot of these cases. Um, so there's that sort of thing. Another popular one, uh, Pogi's writing 2001, when this wasn't, uh, I think, as prominent an issue. I mean, it certainly existed, but it wasn't something that people worried about as much. You know, free trade rules that, that um, don't involve worker protections, this sort of thing. Uh, plausibly are rules of the game that are unfair to uh, poorer people. So, anyway, pick your favorite example, but the first 
plausible way in which this system might be unfair is it might be that the rules of the game are biased against the poor. And uh, you and I, we support these rules, via, largely via our government and our consumption practices. We support these rules. So uh, if that's the situation, the poor are not just poor because of some natural disaster. It didn't just happen that they're poor. They're poor because of us. And so we have some obligation to them some combination probably of changing the rules and compensating them for uh, for having them be at the receiving end of an unfair set of rules. Okay. If you don't like that uh, explanation, a different way in which the system might be unfair is if there was uh, unfair unilateral expropriation of resources. We talked about this a little bit uh, with regard to the left libertarians but here, um, I mentioned the slide colonial because it's the most egregious example, but there might be sort of non-colonial or quasi-colonial uh, parts of this. Here the idea is just that wealth is significantly built on the world's natural resources. The natural resources are all owned <laughs> at this point, um, and most of the people in the world did not have any meaningful say over how those natural resources would be appropriated and how they would be how they would be used. The clearest example is in, in colonialism. Uh, a lot of the wealth of European nations and of America was built on extraction of natural resources from colonial territories where the people who lived there didn't have any meaningful say over it. But even more broadly, you know, as Pogi points out, a lot of the we a lot of the natural wealth of the world is controlled by non-representative governments. It's controlled by um, I won't I won't say Texas that would just be an unfair dig, um, but it's controlled by places like Saudi Arabia, right? Where the government doesn't it's not everybody in Saudi Arabia that has meaningful say in the government. The government is largely non-representative, and so its decisions about how to use its oil don't really represent the will of the people. So this is a different way in which poverty might be unfair, not just bad. It might be that a significant reason why poor people are poor and wealthy people are wealthy in the world that we have today is because <coughs> The natural resources that uh, Pogi, you know, assumes were, in, and he wants to say it's not that they're, that you don't have to believe they're all in common, but there probably is some, you probably do need some view about what they were like in the primordial state. But the basic idea is that the natural resources that in some sense everybody in the world has a, has a stake in um, were instead used for the benefit of the few. And the wealth inequalities we have now are the result of years, decades, centuries of compounding influence of the advantage you get by controlling a lot of the resources. Okay. The last possible way in which the current system of distribution might be unfair as opposed to just bad is probably in a lot of ways the most straightforward um, and the least controversial is that it was based on a history of violence and fraud. Go back to colonialism, right? Colonialism didn't happen because people made nice agreements. Right? Colonialism happened because the Europeans had bigger and better guns. And if you if you want to go back, there's the history of the world is not one of contracts. The history of the world is largely one of violence, conquest, conflict, deceit, trickery, lies. Yeah. None of these things are respectable from a liberal standpoint. Uh, so, if you look at the actual history of the world, of how we got to where we are today, then you might say, well, that, that's what's unfair, right? Um, whatever the individual virtues of some person who lives in Nigeria are, they're going to start in a hole, because the overall economic system of Nigeria has been... Um, influenced by a long history of violence and fraud. Or 
pick your other favorite um, poor nation, right? There are more or less no poor nations that don't have some kind of history of being on the, the sh getting the short end of the stick on violence and fraud. And there are almost and there are more or less no wealthy nations that don't have a history of using violence and fraud against someone else. Now, you might say, um, there are people who say, well, I think we would have ended up in the same place anyway. It's hard to say whether or not that's true, but the point would be that even if we would have ended up in the same place anyway, that doesn't automatically make the distribution fair, right? Again, you know, especially if you're a libertarian and you have this process not pattern kind of view, that's like saying, um, you steal my car, and I, when I complain about it, you say, well, you would have sold this car anyway, right? It doesn't make it fair that you stole my car. We frankly don't know what the world would have looked like if its history was one of contract and compromise rather than one of conquest and conflict. But the world that comes out of that is not fair from a liberal perspective, or, or at least you'd have to do some fancy footwork to explain why it's fair from a liberal perspective. Um, and in fact, even among sort of libertarian and libertarian leaning kinds of philosophers, the response tends to be more like Hume's. The response is not typically, oh yeah, all of that's fine by the lights of our own theory, or oh, none of that ever happened. The response tends to be something more pragmatic in you know, small p pragmatic sense. Hume basically says, look, you got to kind of just ignore that because you can't go back and undo all of it. So let's get a good social contract and we'll move forward from, from where we are. You'll cause more problems if you try to, to dig it all up. But wide consensus that the actual history of the world does not look fair from the standpoint of almost any of the major, major theories. Okay, so this kind of picture focuses on the unfairness of poverty. Pogge points out that you may not like one of these three explanations. Uh, you know, the first two especially are, are more controversial. Uh, Pogge thinks that it is true that the rules are unfair, but not everyone agrees. There's debate about appropriation of resources. Um, there's probably even, some, and there is even debate about not so much whether there was violence and fraud in history, but how much it matters that there was violence and fraud in history. What Pogge is arguing is that um, first of all, at least they're, they all are fairly plausible. They all have some plausibility to them. And so a lot of people, liberals and libertarians alike, um, are going to accept one of them if they think hard about it, Pogi thinks. And he thinks they all lead to basically the same place. Um, he thinks they all lead to his global resources dividend. We'll talk about the second, that in a second. Um, but they certainly all lead to the same place in the abstract and that they all lead to the idea that wealthy-ish people typically owe something to those who are not wealthy. Um, the last caveat that I should put on this is, is the last thing you might say is you might say, wait, 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 wait. Let's take the violence and fraud thing or even the appropriation thing. I, I, I Professor Levine, I never killed anyone and took their land. Oh, sure, you know, I live in America and America has a history of conquering other places in, in you know, in ways that, aren't, that are, are plausibly unfair and unjust. But, you know, I, I wasn't here when the Native Americans were being driven off their land. Why do I owe anything? And I think implicit in Pogi is he's saying it's, it's, it's not an obligation that attaches to you because of your actions. It's uh, a little bit broader than that. It's an obligation that, that attaches because the current system is not one that could live up to a liberal social contract. The system we live in even if we didn't directly do any of the bad things. Uh, the system we live in is not liberally justifiable. Um, either because of its structure or because of its history. So the obligations don't attach to you because of things you've done specifically. The liberals don't need, liberal theorists don't need that. They just need it to be the case that 
you're living in a system that falls short of liberal ideals and hence generates obligations of justice that have become more liberal. Uh, this is very, this is much more similar to the way in which, um, you know, you may not torture anyone, but you might have obligations to try your best to ensure that nobody in your political system is torturing anyone. Um, it's that kind of obligation. You know, if you personally killed somebody, they should, they should, well, they're dead, right? But if, if you personally stole someone's land, like they should sue you. If your system unjustly appropriated, appropriated their land, you owe them trying to change the system and possibly some distributed share of compensation uh, within the system. Okay. Of course, we're policy students, so a lot of the issues arise when the rubber meets the road. Uh, Pogi has what he thinks is this really straightforward, of course it'll work, we just have to get people on board thing, the global resource dividend, which, I'll be honest, I think it's a nice idea. Um, but a lot of people have criticized Pogi for basically, how is this going to work? You know, it's this idea that we take a relatively small percent, we basically put a, a tax on the use of all natural resources, and he thinks this is consistent with more or less any theory of why the system is unjust. If the system is unjust because of the history of violence, or if the system is unjust because the rules are unfair, well, that justifies more or less any kind of compensation. Uh, you know, this can, that, those are both going to justify some kind of compensation. I mean, it's interesting to me that Pogi does not here at least suggest changing the basic rules, right? If if he's right that sovereignty is a problem, you know, why is he not arguing that we should get rid of sovereign states? That's a side issue. But um, so he's say, but he's got this idea that that is especially consonant with the idea that poverty is the result of unjust appropriation of natural resources. That we put a smallish percentage tax on all use of natural resources and we use the money from that to uh, help the poor. A lot of people have criticized Pogi, not without good reason, for, for saying, well, how exactly is this all going to work? Pogi himself seems pretty sanguine that, well, you know, we'll get governments to collect the taxes and disperse it. Or uh, he mentions very briefly there'll be an agency. An agency of what? An, an agency of the United Nations, an agency of the United States, a freestanding NGO-like thing. Pogi doesn't tell us much about it. And when you're starting to talk about an agency that's dispersing uh, his numbers from 2001, he estimates $300 billion a year. Well, that's a kind of a big deal. Um, Pogi may be too sanguine, especially about the ability of transparency and moral suasion to make this all work properly. Um, as one of my friends is fond of pointing out, there's a reason why they call it political economy, right? There would be a huge number of people in Pogi's scheme who would have very, very strong incentives to be corrupted by it, to not do things the way that they say they're going to do it, to use the aid politically, to not pay the money, to, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, Pogi talks about how, well, you, you enforce it with sanctions and there would be strong penalty, there would be strong incentives not to def, not to not pay your dues because then everybody else would sanction you. But he ignores the fact, for instance, that um, there would be strong disincentives to actually apply the sanctions, right? You know, the same way that you would lose more in this massive sanctioning than you would save by not paying your global resource tax. If you, if you're a country, you know, if you're one of the potential enforcers, and um, you are thinking about whether to enforce the sanctions, but you're not sure if your other fellow potential enforcers are going to enforce it, well, then you could be screwed. Um, you are taking you know, you are taking a huge risk by being a sort of a unilateral non-defector um, and imposing the penalties, especially if the um, uh, you know especially if the offender, the one not paying the tax, is someone with something important and and invaluable, right? I mean, 
forget about it if the one not paying the taxes like the United States, right? But even if the one not paying the taxes is a place like Iran, well, you've got a problem. I mean, look at what's going on with the Iranian sanctions regime right now. There are really strong incentives for countries to want to get around this, even when they're concerned about something like nuclear security. So, Pogi may be way, way too easygoing about how this is going to work. Um, other people have suggested, there are some folks who are friendly to Pogi who have suggested, well, um, we like the basic idea, but do it through NGOs. But of course, you know, NGOs are not saintly people who do everything for the right reason without any confusion either. So you have serious problems about it, any kind of scheme. You have serious problems about who is going to deliver all this aid and how do we keep them relatively free of the dysfunctions that attend to actual aid agencies um, and actual aid NGOs. Um, not saying that the, the, Please do not hear this as me saying they're all bad. I'm just saying that, you know, there are real implementation problems in the in the real world. Now, I mentioned in class, right? Someone like like um, Singer might say, look, even if 95% of your aid is wasted, you know, you might as well have burned the money. If even 5% of that gets to the poorest, you know, the wonders of diminishing marginal utility might still make it better for overall utility. Um, even if we have a massively wasteful system for delivering aid. And that may be true, um, but it's at least something that, that needs to be faced up to uh, with, with any kind of actual schema for delivering the wealth from the wealthy to the poor. Um, there are perpetual arguments about aid causing dependence. Uh, some of these are difficult to assess. Some of them are quite clearly true. Uh, there are all sorts of situations in which dumping of cheap or free goods uh, can be damaging to local economies and create, can create a situation where it's difficult for people to get out of the situation in which uh, they are needing to receive aid. So food aid to places like Sub-Saharan Africa and to Haiti often come in for this kind of criticism. Right, you know, the U.S. gives a lot of food aid. We give, but we give money, but we require that money. Essentially, most of that money gets delivered. In the food from that is purchased from American farmers and then basically dumped at low prices on the on the markets there, or even free on the markets there. Great in the short term for someone who can't afford the grain. In the long term, though, has a very very distorting effect on local agriculture. So you need to worry about that sort of thing. Um, similar kind of issues that aid might reinforce bad governance. I think Pogi is pretty plausible by saying that, look, bad governance can't be the whole story. There's bad governance in a lot of wealthy countries. There's corruption in a lot of relatively wealthy countries. Um, we only blame it for poverty in poor countries. And, you know, it's probably part of the reason those countries are poor, but probably not the whole reason. I think that's fairly plausible, at least. But nonetheless, giving aid can reinforce bad governments. Um, a government that might otherwise collapse because it's not able to meet the basic needs of its people, um, if you give it aid, that might perversely prop it up. Um, there are some really egregious examples of this, the aid given to Mobutu in the Congo by the U.S. for largely strategic reasons. But there may be more mundane versions of this all over the place. There are lots of um, poor countries with, eh, you know, not the greatest governments, where a significant portion of their budget comes from aid. And so there is a question. Now, one of the moral questions about this might be, how much you care about the short term versus the long term, right? Implicit in some of these arguments is that, well, if we didn't give money to... Um, we didn't give aid money to Uganda, then uh, maybe their um, maybe their government would change. Well, it probably wouldn't change by people saying, "Well, now I feel now that Museveni is no longer able to provide for people, uh, so I guess we should change." And Museveni says, "Yeah, all right, that's that's fine. I I, I see the writing on the wall." No, probably what will happen, in, in, at least in a lot of places, would be painful, violent, bloody revolution. So 
uh, there might be some, and, and also, you know, starvation and other kinds of problems because they're not getting the aid, right? Um, Uganda, uh, my understanding is that a significant portion of what it spends on healthcare comes from external aid, right? So in the short term, people aren't getting the, the medicine uh, and there might be a violent and bloody revolution. Uh, so part of the moral question about the bad governance thing is how exactly, even if you believe that aid reinforces bad governance, how exactly do you approach that from a policy perspective? What's the morally appropriate way? Is it morally acceptable to say we are willing to accept a significant amount of short-term pain that we could alleviate in this situation in the hopes that in the long term things will be things will be better? Um, that's a pretty serious and weighty moral question. Our right, to local economies. Uh, one interesting question is whether it's necessarily the case that rising wealth, absolute wealth, also increases uh, rel relative inequality. You know, as your country gets gets wealthier, the, the top and the bottom get further apart. Uh, there's some evidence that the wealth inequality is a significant driver of unhappiness. Um, it is quite plausibly a driver of political inequality. You know, what matters in, in the United States is not for my political freedom and my political influence is not just how much money I have. It's how much more money the people donating money to super PACs have than me, right? Um, so, you know, it's A, it's not clear whether you have to get more inequality with more wealth. Um, there's some debate among economists about this. I'm not really qualified to comment on it. There's also some question about whether we should care, right? Do we care if China's Bill Gates is getting 15,000 times as wealthy as he was before, as long as the poorest person in China is getting twice as wealthy as she was before? You know, should we count that as a win because the poorest person gets wealthier? Or do we count that as a problem because the gap widens? And how should we weight those two different concerns? Related to a lot of these other questions is um, whether rather than aid as a way of helping the poor, uh, fairer or even freer trade would be better. There's a strand, um, especially among sub-Saharan African economists, of there's a, a, a school of thought called trade, not aid. This goes back to this issue of maybe the big problem is the, the system of rules. So especially if you think the problem is an unfair system of global distribution rules, maybe the solution is not for a wealthyish person like me to give some money to the poor. Maybe the solution is to change the rules. Um, you have sort of more leftward versions of this, which is the dismantle capitalism uh, kind of approach that says, look, no, just industrial capitalism is a kind of system that's, that, that necessarily is going to generate poverty and environmental destruction and that sort of thing. You also have a, a more kind of small L liberal, possibly somewhat more right-leaning version of this critique, which says, no, look, the, the problem is not free trade. The problem is lack of free trade, right? The problem is that there are all sorts of rules and systems that, uh, that make people worse off. Um, you know, a big target of this is agricultural subsidies. This is, comes out of WTO negotiating rounds all the time. Um, a lot of sub-Saharan economists uh, will say, look, if you just made actual free trade, if you got rid of all the tariffs and you got rid of all the farm subsidies in places like the US and Europe, which is massive amounts on farm subsidies, right? You know, Africa would get a huge shot in the arm developmentally because it'd be a lot cheaper to grow food in Africa and ship it. And the only reason that African farmers can't compete in those markets effectively is they can't make it cheaper than American farmers can make it with massive subsidies. They can only make it cheaper than they would in a free market. So you might ask, where should our focus be? Should our focus be on increasing compensation or should our focus be primarily on changing the rules of the game? And then of course, you've got a question about what should the new rules look like? How do we get there? And don't forget implementation concerns, right? It's all well and good if for, for you know, people to sit down over beers and discuss 
Marx's 1844 economic manuscripts, right? But uh, that's not a, a template for well, how how do we actually do this dismantling capitalism thing that that we're talking about, right? Um, on the free trade, fair trade uh, side of things, you know, it's all well and good to, sit, to to complain about this, but it's actually been really hard to dismantle things like agricultural subsidies, um, and it's not clear how likely it is that you're going to going to be able to succeed in, in doing that. Um, and finally, the reason I give you the, the two short pieces is that a lot of the literature on this, both philosophically and unfortunately in policy, not all of it, but a lot of it, the implicit focus is, is the we, the we of the people who are taking my class, the we of the wealthy-ish, um, or the, the truly wealthy. Um, and not of the poor, right? Even in someone like Pogi, certainly in someone like Singer, what you have is um, the wealthy have agency. The wealthy do stuff. And the poor have stuff done to them. Maybe it's bad stuff, like a system of bad rules imposed on them. Maybe it's good stuff, like money given to them. But they still show up in a lot of the analyses as fundamentally passive. Um, this is another one of those big cans of worms, but I think it's worth mentioning and thinking about in crafting policy. On the one hand, it's just intuitively a little bit icky. Uh, it's intuitively a little bit concerning that we would talk about the fate of the bottom billion. right? Uh, and not have those bottom billion be effective voices on their own behalf in a lot of policy discussions. Um, you know, this this goes beyond just being painted as uh, sort of passive victims. Though that's problematic in and of itself because it affects the way people think about what their obligations are. This actually happens. Uh, you know, this actually has a concrete impact on policy. When I was in Liberia in the summer of 2011, uh, I ended up through a series of boring coincidences, I ended up in a planning meeting of Liberian peace and uh, basically peace uh, NGOs talking about a um, a large conference that was being held in Monrovia about uh, peace and state building, and a number of them were quite annoyed because they were having this you know the UN was sponsoring this large conference in Monrovia on peace and state building to which. The local Liberian NGOs had basically gotten the invitation the day before, and half of them hadn't even gotten the invitation. It was basically a few of them that had email addresses were able to get uh, the invitation. And their complaint was basically, look, you're having this conference in our war-torn country about uh, peace, and you're not even inviting most of us. You invited the government and you invited representatives of international NGOs to come here and talk about peace in a nice hotel well, you know, average Liberians are just not part of it. And that unfortunately, like I said, certainly not universal, but that unfortunately is all too typical of discussions of, uh, of poverty. The, the poor are, are not part of it. And where the poor are part of it, they're often depicted primarily as, as, as victims, helpless victims that, that we need to save. Um, as a practical matter, you know, for those of you who, who are not moved by, uh, by just feeling feeling icky about it. As a practical matter, this might miss some solutions. Uh, you know, a lot of the trade not aid folks, um, <coughs> Easterly is at least sort of moderately in that camp, argue that the focus on kind of top-down statist aid package solutions is largely driven by the fact that these decisions are made by leadership of the G8, not by actual poor people. Um, and there are a number of programs that have come under under fire, uh, the Millennium Villages program, uh, one of them, for basically being planned without serious input from the people being affected. Uh, so we might just, even if you don't care even a little about the message it sends or the symbolism of it, uh, we might miss out on actually useful ways to, to help out poorer people um, if they're not included in the conversation. Okay, that's more or less all I have to say about poverty, and hopefully I have I have bummed you out enough to go and 
wear sackcloth and ashes and give all of your things away to the poor. I'll see you in a bit.